typical grammar lesson. You, the teacher, stands at the front of the class and tells the class, please open your textbooks to page 21, for example. At the top of page 21, there's a set of grammar notes about the topic for the day. You review them with the class and answer any questions students might have. And then you put them to work completing the written exercises that follow the grammar notes. Does this sound familiar? This should sound familiar. I see this over and over and over again when I'm observing teachers. And it's not just the new teachers who present grammar this way. Experienced teachers do it as well. There are some good things about presenting grammar to our students this way, reading the explanation provided in the textbook. The good thing is, it's fairly easy to prepare. There's not a lot of work that we have to do beforehand. And it's also very efficient if we don't have a lot of time to work with. What's wrong with this, however, it's not the most motivating, exciting, and meaningful way for us to present grammar structures to our students. So what are the alternatives? In this video, I'll take you through some of these alternatives. After the demonstrations, we'll do a brief analysis of the strengths of each of these alternatives. By the end of the video, you'll have a series of techniques in your teacher toolbox with which to present grammar to your students in a fun, motivating, and meaningful way. Let's get started with the demonstrations. There are five different techniques that I'm going to show you. You can follow along with the techniques using the tables provided on your handout. The first technique is called explanation on the board. And this is exactly as it sounds. It's very simple. Instead of having our students read the explanation provided in their textbooks, what we do is pull that explanation out of the textbook and put it up on the board. In this way, our students can interact with the explanation as a whole class, and they can bounce ideas off of each other, and you can elicit a lot more from them. Here's the objective for this demonstration. At the end of this lesson, students will be able to make and ask subject and object questions about events in the past using the simple past verb tense. Take a look at the sentence that I've written on the board. George Bush phoned Jennifer Lopez. The first thing we want to do is figure out the parts of this sentence and identify them. So, George Bush is our subject, phoned is our verb, and Jennifer Lopez is our object. Remember in English that we always put the parts of the sentence in subject, verb, object order. So subject goes first, then the verb, and then the object. Let's take out our subject, George Bush, and just put a blank line in there. So right now we don't know who our subject is. We don't know who phoned Jennifer Lopez. We need to make a question so that we can find out this piece of information. To do this, we're going to put a WH word in that blank where George Bush used to be. So now it's going to be who phoned Jennifer Lopez. That's our subject question. So all we've done is take out our subject, George Bush, and we've put in the WH word who and added a question mark at the end. That gives us our subject question. The next type of question, an object question, is a little bit more difficult to make. Just as a quick review, we've got George Bush as our subject, phoned as our verb, and Jennifer Lopez as our object. We're going to take Jennifer Lopez out and put a blank in there because we don't know that information anymore. So how do we make a question to get that object information? The first thing we do is put the word who in our blank space. George Bush phoned who. But this is not correct. We need to mix the order up a little bit more in order to get the correct object question. We're going to take the word who and move it to the beginning. So now we've got who George Bush phoned. This still isn't correct, however. Our next step is to take the verb phoned and split it up into two parts. We're going to make did and phone. So now we have who George Bush did phone. This still isn't correct. We've got to mix our order up a little bit more. We're going to take George Bush and put him in between did and phone. So now we have who did George Bush phone. 
This is our correct object question. We've got our two types of questions, our subject question and our object question here now. Let's take a look at them and see what some of the differences are. Our subject question doesn't need any change in word order. We simply take out our subject and put the word who in. Who phoned Jennifer Lopez? Our object question, on the other hand, takes a bit more work. We have to mix the order up a bit, and we also have to split the verb phoned into did phone. So then we get the object question, who did George Bush phone? That's the end of the demonstration of explanation on the board grammar presentation technique. We've pulled the explanation out of the textbook and put it up on the board so that our students can interact with it. Our students ask questions and offer comments as we go so that we know they're fully understanding the information we're presenting. The next grammar presentation technique is called using realia. If you recall, realia is simply a word to describe real objects. So we're going to use a collection of real objects to elicit the grammar structure from our class. The objective for this demonstration lesson is students will be able to use the third person singular, simple present, to make statements about everyday routines or habits. When I came into the classroom this morning, there was a backpack on one of the desks, and I couldn't find any identifying information, so I don't really know who this backpack belongs to. But there's a bunch of objects in the backpack, so if we take a look at these objects, maybe we can figure out who this backpack belongs to. Let's take a look at what we've got to work with. We've got a little mini Buddha. We've got a ping pong ball. We've got a camel, but he's actually one of those stress things, you know, you can squish them. We've got a ticket, and it says Beijing South on it. We've got a sports watch. We've got a CD, and it looks like it's Irish music. We've got a ping pong paddle to go with our ball. We've got, looks like mascara. We've got a tour book for Chile. We've got a shell. We've got a map here, printed out from Google, and it looks like it's for something like a hospital or something. And then finally we've got a book, and it looks like a Japanese language book. So this is what was in this backpack that I found this morning when I came into the classroom. I'd like you to work with a partner and make lots of sentences about who you think this person is. See if you can come up with ideas about their habits and their routines based on the objects that we found in their backpack. And then maybe we can figure out who they are. Let's get some of your sentences on the board about this person's habits and routines. The first thing we have to do though is decide if this is a man or a woman. And we do have one clue about that. We've got mascara in this backpack, so probably we've got a woman who owns it. So we're going to use the pronoun she. And the first habit we can talk about is she wears mascara. We've got our ping pong paddle and our ping pong ball, so we can say she plays ping pong. We've got the CD of Irish music, so we can say she listens to Irish music. We've got a few clues that tell us something else about her. We've got our Buddha, our shell, our ticket for Beijing South, and a travel book for Chile. We can say she travels a lot. What does the sports watch tell us? Maybe she works out every day. We've got our Japanese language book, so we can say she studies Japanese. We've got our map to a hospital, so maybe she works at a hospital. And last but not least, we've got our squishy camel. So we can say she uses a stress ball to manage her stress. Let's take another quick look at all of these sentences and see what they have in common. So you'll notice they all use she because we're talking about a woman in the third person singular. 
All of the verbs have an S on the end because that's how we conjugate the third person singular. And all of these sentences are talking about habits or routines. One final reminder, we're talking about habits and routines. So these are not things that we do once, like we didn't do it once yesterday and we're not going to do it once tomorrow. These are things that we do fairly often. That's the end of the Using Realia Grammar Presentation Demonstration. This technique is really fun. It gives students concrete visual things to work with as they're wrestling with the grammar structure, and it also allows them the opportunity to be creative. The next grammar presentation technique that we'll look at is called Minimal Sentence Pairs. This is a really cool one. What we do in this technique is we have pairs of sentences that are almost identical. The only way that these sentences are different is their grammar structure. So we could have two identical sentences except one sentence has the simple present and one sentence has the simple past, for example. We then use these pairs of sentences to compare and contrast both the form and the use of the language structures that we're looking at. The objective of this demonstration lesson is that students will be able to correctly select either simple past or present perfect to talk about past experiences. We have pairs of sentences up on the board and these sentences are identical except for the grammar structure. Let's take a look at the first pair. We have sentence A, I have seen the last Lord of the Rings movie. I'm a Lord of the Rings geek, by the way. And sentence B, I saw the last Lord of the Rings movie last month. Here's our second pair of sentences. Sentence A, he has worked for Microsoft. And sentence B, he worked for Microsoft in 1999. Here's our last pair of sentences, this time in question formation. Sentence A, have you ever been to Vancouver? And sentence B, when were you in Vancouver? I'd like you to work with a partner and analyze these pairs of sentences. Figure out what's the same and, most importantly, what's different between the two sentences in each pair. In particular, look at how they're made and also what they mean. Let's start by taking a look at how these sentences are made. Our A sentences are the present perfect, so we've got the verb to have and then the past participle. For example, in our second A sentence, we've got, he has worked for Microsoft. Has is our verb to have, and then worked is our past participle. Our B sentences are the simple past. In these sentences, we simply use the past formation of the base verb. So in our second B sentence, he worked for Microsoft in 1999. Worked is our past form of the base verb work. Now let's take a look at when we use these two types of sentences and what they mean. With our A sentences, there's a meaning of unspecified time. We know these events took place in the past, but we don't really know when. For example, in our second A sentence, he has worked for Microsoft, we know that it happened sometime in the past, but we don't know exactly when this happened. With our B sentences, we know when this event happened in the past. Taking a look at sentence 2, B, he worked for Microsoft in 1999, we know now when it happened, 1999. So this is a specified time. An easy way to understand when we use these two different structures is to draw a timeline. Let's take a look at a timeline for our A sentences. We've got our line of time, and then we mark now, so that's what's happening right now. Our events happened in the past, so we'll put an X somewhere in the past, but with our A sentences, we don't know really when this event happened, so we have to put a question mark there. With our B sentences, however, we know when the event happened, so we can put that specific time on our timeline. In the case of sentence 2B, that would be 1999. I'm going to hand out a written activity that I'd like you to do individually, and then compare your answers with a partner. In this activity, you've got a paragraph, and within each sentence in the paragraph, you've got to make a choice. You have to decide if you're going to use the simple past version of the verb or the present perfect version of the verb. 
and you're going to make this choice depending upon whether it is a specified time or an unspecified time. That's the end of the lesson demonstration for the Minimal Sentence Pairs Grammar Presentation Technique. This technique is particularly effective when you want to do some compare-contrast work with your students with language structures that they easily confuse. The next grammar presentation technique that we'll look at is called generative situation. What we want to do with this technique is create a fun and interesting story in which to place the grammar structures that we're going to present to our students. The objective of this lesson demonstration is that students will be able to use should have to express hindsight in a personal situation. I'm going to tell you a story about a character named Bob. Bob decided he was going to take a trip to Australia. Now, before you take any big trip, you probably want to do some preparations. And it was particularly important for Bob because his plan in Australia was to drive across the desert in the outback. So I'd like you to take a couple of minutes with a partner and think about things that Bob probably wants to prepare before he takes his trip to Australia. What are some things that Bob probably should bring when he does his trip to Australia? Let's take a look at some of these. Probably he needs a map, this would be very useful. He needs some extra gas because he's driving and he doesn't know when the next gas station will be. Probably needs some water and some food would be a good idea. Maybe it would be a good idea for him to have things like a first aid kit with bandages and bug bite medication, all that kinds of stuff. He probably also wants some type of repair materials for his car in case it breaks down. And maybe a communication device would be a good idea as well. So there's lots of things that Bob really needs to get together before he takes his trip to the Australian desert. Now let's take a look at our story about Bob. Well, Bob didn't do any of the preparations that we just talked about because Bob's a little bit of an idiot. He did not plan anything. He didn't take extra water, he didn't take gas, he didn't take a first aid kit, he didn't even take a map. Here's what Bob looked like when he came back from his trip to the Australian desert. I'd like you to get together with a partner and thinking about this picture of Bob after his trip to Australia, talk about what you think happened to him when he was in the Australian outback and be really creative. There are lots of possibilities for what happened to Bob while he was on his trip. Here are some of them, but we'll also get some students to share their ideas as well. Maybe Bob got lost. Um, it looks like he had some kind of accident because he looks like he's got a broken arm. Um, his hair is kind of sticking up and he's got bags under his eyes, so I doubt that he got much sleep. There were probably lots of bugs that he couldn't get away from. And maybe he ran out of gas as well because I actually don't see his car in this picture anywhere. So Bob had a bit of an adventure on his trip because he didn't do any of these preparations. What do you think about Bob now? Maybe not too bright, not very organized, he really didn't do a very good job with this trip. And he ended up in a pretty bad state by the end of the trip. Not something you'd want to repeat yourself. There's a particular language structure that we can use when we want to talk about our disapproval or a disagreement with somebody's past actions. So in this case, we kind of disagree with Bob's lack of planning for his Australian trip. And there's a language structure we can use to talk about this. So we speculated that Bob didn't take a map. So if we want to express disapproval about this, we can say, Bob should have taken a map. We also talked about the fact that Bob didn't bring any extra water. So, to express our disapproval about this, we can say, Bob should have taken extra water. Here's one more example. We talked about Bob not bringing extra gas. So we can say the same thing. Bob should have taken extra gas for his car. Let's take a closer look at how we put this kind of sentence together. We use our subject, he and then should have, and then our advice or our disapproval piece comes next. So, he should have taken extra water, or he should have taken extra gas. Or, one more example, he should have taken a first aid kit. When we're saying this, we kind of put our should have together, 
and we say should have. So if I'm saying this quickly with my connected speech, he should have taken a first aid kit. That's the end of the lesson demonstration for the generative situation grammar presentation technique. As I mentioned, this one is really fun and it allows both you and your students to be very creative. And don't worry if you're not an artist. The worse your pictures are for this type of technique, actually the more fun your students are going to have. Our final grammar presentation technique is called using a written text. The idea of this technique is that we use a piece of writing as the basis for an analysis of how a language structure is used in context. The objective of this lesson demonstration is that students will be able to use the passive voice to differentiate between new and known information in a written text. I've put the title for a written text on the board. Crocodile attack down under. I'd like you to get into small groups and talk about the vocabulary that you expect to find in this piece of writing. Let's get some of your vocabulary ideas up on the board. You might see words like blood, blood stain, bandage, wound, infected, painful, afraid, and terrified. Take a look at your handout and read the story, Crocodile Attack Down Under. While you're reading, first of all, check to see if any of your vocabulary predictions were correct. And second, see if you can get an idea of what really happened in this story. Who was attacked and how badly were they hurt? And then what happened at the end of the story? I've got two sentences up on the board. Let's take a look at them. A small crocodile attacked her, that's sentence one. And sentence two is, she was attacked by a small crocodile. You'll notice that the second sentence is the one that's in the text. So we're going to take a look at these two sentences and figure out how they're different, and then we'll decide why the second sentence was used in the written text. Sentence number one is the active voice. We've got the doer of the action, the small crocodile, in the beginning part of the sentence as the subject. Then we've got the verb, attacked, and then we've got the object, her. Our second sentence is the passive voice. We've switched things up a bit in this sentence. We've taken the doer of the action, the small crocodile, and put it at the end of the sentence. And we've put the word by in front of it. So we have by a small crocodile at the end of our sentence. Then we've taken our object, her, and put it at the beginning of our sentence as she. Finally, we've had to do something to our verb. We've had to split it out and put the verb to be in front of it. So we have was, which is our be verb, and then attacked, our past participle, as our two verb components in the passive voice. In addition to understanding how we make the passive voice, or how we make sentence number two, we also have to understand why we would choose to use it. Because we do have a choice. We can use the active voice or the passive voice. You'll probably notice that we most often use the passive voice in written texts, as opposed to spoken texts. The main reason that we use the passive voice is we want to shift the emphasis onto information that we don't know, or the new information. In English sentences, the emphasis is automatically on the information at the end of a sentence. So with the passive voice, we're shifting the emphasis to whatever is at the end of the sentence. In this case, it's the small crocodile. We do this because that's the new information or the unknown information. We don't know what attacked her, so we're going to put the emphasis on that new information, the crocodile. I'm going to put you to work again. Take another look at the text, Crocodile Attack Down Under. Find all of the examples of the passive voice and underline them. Then together with a partner, talk about why the passive voice is used in each of those particular situations. So you don't just need to understand how to make the passive voice, you need to understand why you want to use it. That's the end of the lesson demonstration for the grammar presentation technique using a written text. This technique is really useful for demonstrating how we use a particular piece of language or a language structure in context. looked at these five grammar presentation techniques, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes 
to analyze each one in terms of its strengths, so what it's really good for, and also things to watch out for when you're using this technique with your classes. The explanation on the board technique is really good because it's very fast and it's very direct. It's also really easy for teachers to prepare. We simply have to pull that information out of the textbook. Finally, it's really good because it's a technique that our students are comfortable with. They're familiar with it, they're used to it, and they know exactly what to expect. There are a couple of things to watch out for with this technique. It can be predictable if you use it too often, so be careful about that. Be careful about your choices of example sentences. You want to spice them up, make them a little bit fun, so that the technique does not become boring for your students. And finally, you want to build in some checkpoints just to make sure students are actually retaining the information that you're presenting. The technique using Realia also has its strengths. It's engaging and interesting for students to work with these real objects. It allows students to create a story or work in some kind of context with the language. And finally, it allows you as the teacher to figure out a little bit what students already know about this particular language structure. There are a couple of things to watch out for with this technique. You may not always get the type of example sentence that you're looking for. You may get a completely different language structure. So you'll have to become used to reshaping the sentences you get into the language structure that you're looking for. You also have to be a bit careful in case students don't know anything at all about this language structure, then you're going to have to help them out a little bit more. Minimal sentence pairs is a really effective technique. It allows you to very clearly establish the contrasts that exist between two verb tenses or language structures. It also allows you to focus on the use of those structures rather than simply how to make them. And finally, it once again allows you to figure out what students actually know about this particular language structure. There are a couple of things to watch out for with this technique. You want to be careful that you allow enough time to actually write your sentences very carefully. You can't just pull minimal sentence pairs out of a hat. It does take some time to come up with good sentences. You also want to make sure that your minimal sentence pairs are as identical as possible. The only difference between your two sentences in the pair should be those language structures that you're focusing on. The strengths of the generative situation technique are that it is interesting and engaging because once again it's a story and we can always pull our students in with a good story. This technique also allows you to present the language structures in context. With this technique, you once again have to be careful that you allow yourself enough planning time to come up with a story that fits the language structure that you're teaching. As you're teaching, you also have to shape the language that you get from the students so that you focus on that particular language structure. The strengths of using a written text as a grammar presentation technique may sound familiar. You're once again placing the language in a context or in a story. This makes it a very engaging and very interesting technique for your students. In order to use this technique effectively, you have to find the right text to use. So it might take a little bit of searching to find that story or that text that's going to work. In many cases, you won't find an authentic written text that you can use. You'll have to adapt it you'll probably have to go into the text and add a little bit more of the target language structure. I'm going to put you to work. I'd like you to think about a language structure that either you taught recently or you're going to teach in the near future. Think about all of the five different presentation techniques that we've looked at and based upon the strengths and challenges of each, select the most appropriate technique for the language structure that you're going to present and make a lesson plan. this video I presented you with a fairly typical scenario that we see all the time in a grammar class. The teacher and the students open their grammar textbooks, they read the grammar notes together, and then students complete some written activities on that particular language structure. In this video we've presented you with five techniques that allow you to go beyond that. When you add these techniques to your repertoire, you'll be able to present grammar to your students in a fun, meaningful, and motivating way.